Hello, boys and girls. Welcome in to the Boys and Girl Podcast with Cowboys NFL Network reporter Jane Slater and NFL Network producer Bobby Belt. A Cowboys community with the inside scoop on the Dallas Cowboys. Now, coming straight to you from the Lone Star State, here's Jane and Bobby. All right. Well, I was one of the ones who went on record this uh, year heading into this season, Bobby, and said that this was a team that had an embarrassment of riches. I mean, you looked at them on paper. They seemingly had depth. They had a nice mix of uh, picks in the draft this year where they identified numerous areas, save for really the safety position. Um, and they had, they had, you know, some guys coming back that you thought were really going to finally have the year. And it's quickly gone from embarrassment of riches to an embarrassment. So this is your fault is what you're telling me that you, you, you got us all worked up and it's that, no, I'm just kidding. You know, you know, I will say this has been, um, I don't think from a talent level, I, I think, I do think that they have naturally talented football players. And I think that you're seeing football players that, you know, have played better in the past that are not playing up to it now. And it's not just age or anything. It's just, they're making some bad mistakes and so from a macro perspective, not just talent, but you look at all the things that go into it, talent and IQ and effort and heart and chemistry and things like that, this so far through six weeks is one of the worst teams I've seen them field. This is a, this is a, probably around 2010, the team that got Wade Phillips fired. Um, and it's, it's just, it's a little frustrating and curious. And I think everybody today, the players, uh, the coaching staff and probably the Joneses are sitting around going, what is, what's the answer here? And, and it's tough because this is about a year and a half now of going, what is the answer here? Cause we were asking this question a lot last year of why is this, why are things playing out the way that they are? And as much as there are injuries at play here, you got some players who just are not playing up to snuff some veteran players who are good football players who you've given big money to, who are just not playing at the level they should be. And I, I know this report that I had today, uh, I expected that it would make the rounds. I don't know. Maybe it was a little naivete on my part that this thing would explode as much as it did because I, I felt like some of this was a little obvious. Um, reporting that, you know, at two and four, things were beginning to leak from the locker room. I'm being told that uh, this is just not a good coaching staff. They don't know how to teach. Um, and that essentially the players aren't buying into this. And I, I think I'm a little shocked given the fact that, as you and I have discussed on this podcast, uh, the, the messaging to the players has been, let's keep everything insulated. It's our one competitive yep. advantage. Um, and so I wasn't really hearing a lot. And so when we would talk about, well, why are the Cowboys struggling defensively or offensively? Are, is there a buy-in? We would hear these things that have are, that would start being said. You know, it started with Jalen Smith talking about simplifying the playbook, which, if you'll recall, I said that feels a little disrespectful to a new coaching staff. Whether yeah. that's true or not, if I have a new boss that comes in at NFL Network and I'm asked, Jane, how do you like the direction of your network? I say it's you know it's going well. I think we're all getting getting to a point we're getting to know each other we're filling each other out or or or, or some growing pain. let's let's look at it a little differently too because you may if your boss is asking you directly if mike mccarthy or mike nolan is asking jalen smith directly how do you feel it's maybe not the worst thing to air out and say hey look this is just what i'm seeing and have that respectful discussion but you wouldn't go on twitter or you wouldn't do a podcast interview and say i really don't think uh you know i think my like network boss is boss. Yeah. <laughs> exactly in, in the public you say it's great if you have any issues you deal with those in private I, and again, I appreciated his transparency. Sure. I, I appreciate the honesty just from, I think most people, if asked, given a new boss and a new regime, you might wait maybe at least until the end of the season and you have a bigger sample size before you say something like that. Then we heard Everson Griffin talking about abandoning the three-point stance and Mike McCarthy admitting that it looked like they were improvising a little bit out there and they needed to buy in more. And then you've got Daniel Jeremiah questioning their effort and guys just giving up. And so take all that in their to that totality. And I think you and I have been privately saying, I feel like there's a disconnect. I, I don't know if these guys are buying into this coaching staff. Now, I think it's hard 
to fully evaluate this coaching staff, given the fact they didn't have their starting quarterback, Dak Prescott, in the quarterback room in the virtual OTAs. He was sort of your natural leader, right? He was away from the facility and he was working out with the guys, but he wasn't in that room to help set the tone with this new staff. Right. So I'm talking offensive side of the ball. On the defensive side of the ball, what we knew about Rod Marinelli is he really bought into these players as it related to how they played on the field, but also bought into them as men. And so when you've got a new coaching staff, it's hard to buy into guys who are as men if you're not seeing them face to face until you get to a condensed training camp. And then you're just focused on not even preseason games. You're focused on playing the L.A. Rams. And so I think we, we need to really honestly evaluate that. That's I think that's one thing to think about. And then you get injuries. I, I, we're not just talking. I mean, you, had, you lost two starting corners on defense. You lost Gerald McCoy early in camp. This is supposed to be like the linchpin of your defensive line. You lose not only Sean Lee at linebacker, but then you lose Leighton Van Der Esch within the first quarter of the first game. So, again, we're just talking defense. Yep. Then I go to the, the offensive side of the ball. You lose Blake Jarwin. Blake Jarwin. And then we start losing the offensive line. Your, stu- your two starting tackles, your center, and then – I look at the game last night, and there goes the last guy with any semblance of experience, Zach Martin. Now Connor Williams is your most seasoned vet on the line. I can see how this frustration would set in and why people might be voicing discontent today, I guess. But my long-winded way of saying this, Bobby, is the writing's been on the wall for a little bit. Yeah, and I think that what you're seeing here, and this is speculative mostly. I mean, there's nothing we can say to prove it, but I think you are seeing it's funny timing that last night seemed to be one of their poorest performances, and you're starting to see people speak out, like you're, you're starting to hear from people. I don't know that that's a coincidence that as soon as somebody who's as important to the nucleus and, and the culture there as Dak Prescott is pulled out and removed from it, that things get a little, you know, out of control, Um, and you know, I think that it's just, I I think people don't necessarily realize what a stabilizing factor that he's been. I know we've talked about it before. Um, Randall, you know, you look over the years, a guy like people wouldn't have known last year. Randall Cobb was a big stabilizing factor in that locker room. Randall Cobb really looked out for, um, you know, the culture and, and how, you know, he, he did a, he did a big part leading in that. And I think people don't know about the Randall Cobbs or don't know exactly. They know Dak Prescott's the quarterback and he says the right things, but they don't understand what type of role he plays to keep everything cohesive. Or, you know, the Sean Lees, who we'll talk to Sean Lees' agent here in a few minutes, Mike McCartney, that, you know, what it is those guys do to make sure that everything is, you know, on the level and everybody's doing their part and everybody's comfortable with where things are going. And I think when you pull out not just Sean Lee, or Dak Prescott, or then Randall Cobb leaves, or you pull out, you know, Travis Frederick, who was a captain for a long time, and Byron Jones, who's been here for a long time, and then you blow out an entire coaching staff that had the same messaging for a decade, it's it's an adjustment period. And I think you're seeing some natural pushback that would come to a group of players that just, they're dealing with something new. Whether they're right or wrong, they're dealing with something new, and it's different than the culture they've always, you know, had. You know, and it's interesting that you point that out because I, I keep looking at, yes, there are injuries as it relates to the season, but the most damaging injury that they've had in recent years was the loss of Tony Romo. And this was a relatively young team, if you'll recall, back in, what, 2016? Yep. And not only do you lose Tony Romo, you lose Kellen Moore. And then you're looking down the depth chart and you're like, oh, now we're going to go with this guy. We got the fourth round, four string guy behind Jamil Showers. And even talking to players that were in that locker room then and aren't there now, they talk about the tone and the culture that he set in such a short amount of time. It was why it was nearly impossible for the Jones family and Jason Garrett and was it Wade Wilson or Scott Linehan that had had a hand in this one or both? Well, I mean, both. Wade was the quarterback coach. Linehan was the offensive coordinator. They didn't go with the guy that they've had since the early 2000s who had come back healthy and was a seasoned vet because of the leadership that Dak evoked, that the the way that this team rallied around him in adversity. And we saw this time and time again when their backs were against the wall, when you would ask these players about this team, they always said they felt like with Dak they could pull out the win and yesterday it felt like the minute that Zeke fumbled 
that ball and the defense came out and, and we'll get into this with RJ Ochoa from blogging the boys that we're gonna have here on, in, a, in a bit. It was as if any optimism from this team sort of, anything that was left sort of escaped. And I think again, that speaks to questioning whether they actually have the talent and the moxie, but also believing they don't have the coaching staff to put them in a position to get to, in other words, this coaching staff wasn't the reason they over they overcame uh, some of these deficits, these double digit deficits. It was the players, but the players, to be fair, also put them in these yeah. situations. Yeah, I mean, so, and, and uh, I had you know that meme where it's like Spider Man. They're all kind of looking. Yes, at each exactly. Other. They're pointing at yes. It's uh, yeah. There's I a feel lot like of right now. It's players and coaches. Yeah, very much that. Uh, I think there is a shared responsibility here not just between players and coaches it's probably one of those three-way little spider-man pictures because it's also the joneses and i think that the joneses you know that is the one constant that's been here for 25 years during a championship drought um and that you know i think that they would have to and i don't think they push back against this necessarily they wouldn't say they've done everything correctly over 25 years they know they have some responsibility in how this has gone um, but I think everybody's got a big hand in it right now. And it's just not helped that they've been dealt adversity of, you know, all these injuries to big guys and, 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 you know, leaders. And, um, and I think that it's, it's just starting to catch up to them. And even as bad as the NFC East is, I don't think that this team right now, you could say should be the favorite. I, I don't know that this is a team that you think could just, you know, scrape by and get into the playoffs. I don't, I don't see how, they would be in any better a position to win this division than Philadelphia or Washington. Um, I think if Washington got a little bit more consistent quarterback play, they'd easily win the division. But, um, you know, that's going to be a tough test for them again next week, too, is having to go up against that Redskins defensive line with all the holes on the offensive line. And Andy Dalton's, you know, he, he got out of some sacks last night, but he's not Dak and he doesn't get the ball out as quick as Dak. And so I did have one of my uh, favorite notes I found last night, and I know you saw this, is that uh, the Cowboys have been uh, pretty evenly distributed and in, in how they're getting, you know, hit pretty hard on defense. That usually you've got below average pass defense and terrible run defense or below average run defense and terrible pass defense. The Cowboys have been pretty equally bad at it. So I was just curious, like, I wonder how, who the last team was that's done this, where the Cowboys have given up 14 uh, touchdown passes and 10 rushing touchdowns through six games. And so I was curious, okay, who's the last team that did it? So I looked it up, and the last team that did it was the 2005 San Francisco 49ers that were coached by Mike Nolan and had the offensive coordinator, Mike McCarthy. Not that Mike wow. McCarthy has anything to do about the touchdowns, given it, but two mainstays of that culture in San Francisco that struggled so much in 2005 are here now in Dallas, and uh, it's a repeat. And again, I'd love to sit down and have some lemonades with Mike McCarthy and get his sense of like what is truly going on. It is this is a very challenging year in how we collect our intel and our information because we don't have that interaction that we would typically have uh, in a normal year. So it's been hard to sort of make sense about what's going on in there. And just my sense now when you take what we've heard on the record and now what I'm I'm hearing today off the record. The reason why I even put it out, because I don't I don't love putting out inflammatory reports like this. It's typically not good for a locker room. Um, it's not good, obviously, for the coaching staff. The way I viewed it was it can't get any more broken. And maybe this forces a come to Jesus that needs to happen during the season. What I can expect on Wednesday when our podcast comes out and when the Cowboys are back in the building, um, there'll be a denial of the report. There'll be a vote of confidence for the coaching staff. Um, I'm never going to name my sources. Uh, those sources are never going to acknowledge what was said. But what was worth and, and bared reporting, in my opinion, was this goes deeper than injuries and effort. This is a lack of a buy-in. And it's early enough, and this division is bad enough that you can right the ship. So again, maybe this prompts a come to Jesus meeting, but I thought it important to report that we've been questioning, is there a buy-in? What's the morale in that locker room? And what I reported today uh, was interesting to say the least, but I think to your point, I think this 
falls on players. I think this falls on coaches. I think this falls on the Jones family. It's a collaborative effort of awfulness. <laughs> to, to borrow a phrase from Jason Garrett, this has been a collaborative effort from everybody or a collaborative lack of effort. But, you know, it's funny. I was. Um, I think you do bring up a very good point, Bobby. We're seeing a lot of the same guys on the football field this year. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the their performances last year to this year, there is a, a massive disconnect. I think what's hard is, is it because of COVID? Is it because they weren't able to get into performance centers? Was it because they didn't have uh, OTAs? Is it because they didn't have preseason games? It is so hard to say this is absolutely the coaches. But what is important is the players, at least at this point, don't buy into these coaches at all right now. Well, and it's tough, like, because, and that's concerning. It, because of that point, it's tough to then look at it and go, okay, well, you know what? Uh, Kevin Stefanski was a brand new coach in Cleveland who's having the same issue, and, and he's, you know, making lemonade out of lemons. And uh, Rod Marinelli and the Raiders are getting good pressure right now. And Matt Eberflus and the Colts, they're getting lots of turnovers, and, and they're, you know, one of the best defenses in the league. It's just, it's tough that goes, okay, when you see coaches that leave and have success elsewhere or or like we saw in the past players that go elsewhere and have success because that was one of the things people always pointed to with rod marinelli was said well okay players are going off and they're having better success than they had with rod marinelli so when you see both the coaches and the players leave and start having better success you go maybe there is an overall culture issue here that explains why everybody's struggling and look i'll never sit here and say uh jason garrett was the best offensive coordinator they ever had. I think what stood out about Jason was his ability to get guys to play for him. In my time covering this team, I never once had a player that was in that locker room tell me they did not buy into him as a coach. A lot of them saw themselves as, depending on what era they were, especially this younger group, they saw themselves as sort of Jason's kids. Yep. Um, Jason viewed them as his kids. And with the exception of the Tavon Austin comment. Which, which was handled, was. which was handled and he corrected. He corrected and, corrected and apologized for. And that was the only time I really saw this locker room sort of go, Rick, mm -hmm. what is that? Even the players like Des, who grew frustrated with with Jason, they patched things up. Mm -hmm. And so say what you want about Jason. I just, in covering this team, and the reason why I defended him as much as I did last year is I said, look, these guys play for him, no matter what the situation was. I don't know if it's fair to say guys don't play for Mike. I don't think he's been here long enough to, it takes a while to build that trust, to develop that buy-in. Jason, of course, was here as a quarterback. He was sort of part of the organization. You knew that he was Jerry's guy, right? Mm -hmm. But I just, I never heard a lot of these players, teammates and players, uh, talk about him the way that I've heard people talk about Mike on the way out of Green Bay and, and his short time here. And again, this criticism doesn't just fall on his shoulders, but sure. as I told you a couple of weeks ago, this falls at my feet he hired a lot of these guys that a lot of these players aren't buying into either. And again, I've got to be very vague about what I say. And because again, you don't want to create problems in the locker room. The purpose of this report was this thing is broken in this way, this early. And that is concerning because you can't overcome that. No, I think, I think that's, you can try it's early, but no, you, the, the pro, and that's the biggest thing. It doesn't matter how much talent you have. You can't overcome locker room cancer. You can't overcome culture, culture cancer. That's the biggest killer of teams. Like we've seen that throughout history in any sport is that no matter how talented you are, when there is, you know, chemistry cancer, it's a killer. And, and you know, it's terminal. Um, and I think that's the thing that the Cowboys have to work out right now is what is the diagnosis. And right now it doesn't look good. But we can continue this conversation. We're actually going to bring in uh, RJ Ochoa from Blogging the Boys now. And uh, after that, we'll talk with Mike McCartney, the agent for Sean Lee. Joining us now is RJ Ochoa, managing editor for bloggingtheboys.com. You can follow him on Twitter at RJ Ochoa. Brocho, how's it going? 
It's going well. It's good to be with uh, my friends Bobby and Jane. Um, certainly wish it was under better circumstances, I think. Um, no, you a, don't. No, you uh, don't. You love it for your writing purposes. You're like, oh, yeah, I, I can. I, if it bleeds, it leads. You're excited right now. Don't even lie. The chaos is fun. Um, and for that, I owe a huge uh, thank you to Jane, certainly on uh, on this fine Monday. Um, it's it's an interesting time. I'll say that. You know- Let me ask you this. I. I- you literally sift through all these interviews, even more so than I do, because sometimes it is so hard for me to, to do TV, but also jump on for Steven and Jerry. There's so many people that talk on this Dallas beat. When you started hearing things from Jalen Smith early into the season, talking about simplifying this playbook and Mike McCarthy talking about he needs to do a better job coaching or it falls on his feet or guys are improvising and they don't want this to be a one call defense. Did this report shock you at all? I don't think so. Um, I think Jalen's quotes are among the more interesting to listen to. Um, and and something I've gone back and listened to a lot in the last few weeks is from his introductory press conference when he signed his long-term extension. And there's a line where he says, I'm a leader and someday I'm going to be a captain for the Dallas Cowboys. And I've never heard a player, uh, be that intentional about speaking about something like that. I, I certainly don't doubt that it's, it's a goal for people. Uh, but that's why what Jalen says is really interesting to me. And so, yeah, I, I don't find it shocking. Um, I, I think that there's a lot of, I think a lot of people try to connect dots in their minds, like who said this and who's thinking that. And, and Jalen is somebody that is kind of a poster for a lot of the problems right now. And so I think that when you kind of, sort of put together the Venn diagram for Jalen specifically. Um, I'm not shocked that, that this is happening, even though he is really positive with, with all of his comments, they, they are kind of, you know, they're, they're sort of forthcoming in an ambiguous way, if that makes sense. And so it makes sense that we're here. Well, and like I said, he is not the only one that it seems has, has discussed some frustration. I mean, like I said, there's been Everson Griffin that has sort of talked about abandoning what is being asked of him. And we're seeing it on the football field, right? Uh, all you have to do is pop in the tape, and it looks like they're just going with their own instincts as opposed to trusting the process, as Jason Garrett used to talk so much of. And so I think the only thing that that was shocking to me, really, in the spirit of the report, RJ, was that they're so frustrated this, this soon. And I, I think it makes sense that you'd be frustrated given all the injuries, but... We've seen them publicly point the finger at themselves, but it sounds like internally they're also pointing the finger to the outside. And as Bobby and I discussed earlier, we're still dealing with very similar personnel from what we saw last year. Yes, some of this is effort from the players, but did they just ask going to do too much too soon in a condensed training camp? And should you have known the limitations of this team and tried to reinvent the will when it made a little bit more sense to do it in the OTAs in the off season. I think all of that is fair. Um, I think it's really interesting. I know Jane, you said in your hit on Monday, you talked about how this team never quit under Jason Gary. That's something we, we've all said. Today's the one year anniversary, at least Monday is, uh, or Tuesday, excuse me, of when the Cowboys played the Eagles last year on Sunday Night Football after they lost to the Jets and everybody thought, you know, oh, this is it. This is where the, the skid really starts and they beat them 37 to 10. And that was kind of the, yep, told you, Jason Garrett's guys don't quit on him. And I do think it's interesting. I think Jason Garrett's kind of been um, in a weird way, a safety net for the Cowboys players because he's always, or was always this, well, that's the problem, right? Like Jason Garrett. So he, he's always the the first person that anybody pointed to blame. And I think Dak Prescott was obviously a different sort of, of not safety net, but sort of hero that came in and saved them. And there's nowhere for anybody to hide. And I think that that makes people uncomfortable. And I think that's why this is also not shocking And it's predictable in a really unfortunate way that the moment the, the heat got really turned up and they had to be the ones to put it out, they kind of started looking inward and pointing fingers, which is, you know, a bit troubling. I think it's interesting that when you think back to last year and the way they talked about their execution issues, because there was that big debate for a while of execution versus preparation. Where's your issue? Like, what are we, what are we to glean from this? Or, you know, we were all trying to figure out, you know, are you a group of players that are not prepared to go out there or do you have the right preparation and you guys are failing to execute? And the players were, were really insistent all year last year that this is 
you know, this isn't about preparation. This is about us going out there and we're making mistakes. And Jalen specifically, I remember, would get very defiant and say, these are Sunday mistakes. These are day of mistakes. This is not about Monday through Saturday. And so then it's interesting that a year later, Jalen's going, yeah, you know, maybe the coaches could uh, simplify things a little bit. And Jane's hearing from players that, you know, they don't really know what they're doing. This isn't just, we never heard this during Jason Garrett's time. This is, we heard the exact opposite during Jason Garrett's time. And those players would seem to do anything to alleviate responsibility from the coaches and their preparation. And we're seeing kind of the opposite from that right now. And I just wonder, is, is that growing pains? Is that players just adjusting to a new normal for themselves and you know oh, this is kind of weird this is like you know parents get divorced and we have a new stepdad here or stepmom and you know we're getting used to being under them or is this just you know something where this is this isn't about in contrast to Garrett they're they're having troubles this is about they just as a group regardless of comparing it to Garrett or not they don't trust Mike McCarthy and they don't trust this coaching staff I think you, you equate it to divorced parents. To me, I remember when I was a freshman in high school, our English teacher was really rough. And that wasn't something that we were used to in middle school. Like, you know, at that age, like you just, you don't do anything and you get good grades. And she actually sort of demanded that we read the book and, you know, be accountable what in that jerk. regard. And, and yeah, I know it was, it was Lord of the Flies. It wasn't a, a great <laughs> novel, if, if I'm being honest, but, um, and, and it feels like that's the case. Like I, and I, I find it fascinating that, that Zeke would come out and be super accountable and say, that's on me. And I, you know, say something like I gave them momentum and I don't, I can't think of the last time I heard any Cowboys defensive player be that individually accountable to something. I know DeMarcus well, Lawrence DeMarcus said they Lawrence. were soft. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's fair. I mean, he called them soft, but I think a lot about too um, last year, I think it was after the bears loss when I believe it was Mike Garofolo reported that the Cowboys really missed the leadership of Tyrone Crawford and how the young leaders on the team weren't stepping up. Mm -hmm. And it just, it feels like it, Zeke is a young leader. And I know people say, you know, running backs don't matter in the contract and that's a whole different decision and discussion, but it, it, that there's just, there's a disconnect there. Like there had to be a point between one coaching staff and another where something connected them and said, okay, we're going to carry this over. But it just, it kind of feels like they're just saying, man, you know, the way you move the furniture around, that's why this is, is wrong. And that's why this is messing up. And it feels like that's such an easy thing to point to and blame. Um, even though the problem seems a lot larger than that. You know, guys, I, well, I want to walk you back to because some of the stuff begins to sort of trigger my mind is because it has been such an, a weird year and it's been such an anomaly. I did find it interesting, even before COVID struck, that one of the first calls that Mike McCarthy didn't make was to his quarterback. Mm -hmm. And remember, yeah. a lot of these guys talked about they hadn't really had much contact with him. I, I believe a lot of them got a call the day of his press conference to come up and meet him. Um, and there were guys that were huge fans of his, Randall Cobb among them. And then, of course, he was no longer here. I just found it very interesting that we sort of started off the bat with that. And again, I don't want to get into specifics of where the frustration lies or where the buy-in isn't or what side of the ball it is, because I think we've got to be careful. Uh, as I had said on the fan earlier today, in the past, it didn't behoove these players to go on record. I mean, think about Alan Hearns when he called out. Mm. Uh, Alan Hearns, Ryan it. Switzer, Bryce Butler, Des Bryant, all receivers, by the way. But yeah. Alan's mom, too, by the way, Mrs. Hearns. Yes. Right. Remember, I just I remember pulling Alan aside and being like, why would you how does it help you to name check? And so when people are like, you know, put your name on it, it's you know, it's chicken, it's anonymous. I, I get it because you haven't seen the production on the field from the guys either. But I also push back. This is why we have anonymous sources. In these particular situations, I mean, we're talking job security and especially in COVID and trying to get these guys in given the testing. I mean, a guy could be out of job. And so mm -hmm. I certainly don't want to be responsible for that. I, I, this, to me, again, the spirit of the report was we don't just have a players are good enough situation in Dallas. We don't have just a we don't have enough players because of injury situation in Dallas. We have a guys aren't buying into this coaching staff situation and I just never heard that with Rod Marinelli or for that matter Jason Garrett as hard as Rod could be on these guys defensively 
RJ, did you ever hear anything? Bobby, you talked to a lot of people. I, I had to, I had a player one time get like teary eyed and cry when they talked about what Rod Marinelli meant to them. And so, and no, I never heard that. I had, I had two players like very emotionally talk about how he would print out pictures of presidents and say what characteristics of those presidents that that particular player embodied. And so it was those little things that his investments in them away from the field meant a lot. And, and again, I don't know if that's harder to do given COVID. You know, is that is it harder in a condensed season? Is it harder not to be able to, you know, have family dinners uh, that you normally would at in, in Oxnard at training camp? So, you know, when, when I got this information, I wanted to make sure where it's not if it's we have to temper it by saying the spirit of it is that they've lost the locker room somehow, but could they ever have properly secured it given some of the factors that went into this season? I think that's a really fair question. I also think like you say this and a lot of Cowboys fans say, oh, well, they, they didn't win anything like whatever, but like Jason Garrett presided over an era. I mean, it, you know, the, it was a long time. Like obviously that didn't have the success that anybody would want, but I mean, you're talking, he was the only coach to ever be the head coach of the Cowboys in the history of the star. Right. I mean, he was the, coach for the majority of the life so far of AT&T stadium. Like he's obviously this, this dude with, you know, these intense ties to the organization. And that, that is that, you know, like my, is Mike McCarthy. I mean, again, in, in a vacuum, is he going to, to Duke UNC games with guys? Like, can you, can you see that like off the top of your head? Um, I also think, you know, and I don't mean this as a demerit against Mike McCarthy, but Jason Garrett's one of the most charismatic people I've ever been around. Um, the, the, the people are laughing at you right now. You need to well, clarify that it's not necessarily like in the press conference setting because people are right. going, what no, the hell yeah, are you like, talking like about? Press conference, Jason, is is a totally robotic sort of situation. Um, but the the best example I have is the the proverb he's told about the, I believe it was the Buddhist, uh, you can correct me oh. if I'm wrong, Jane. Mm -hmm. the, and when he told that story, when, at least when I heard it, I was captivated. The, the way he told that story uh, about the bushel of strawberries and everything and that he is, I, I could, as you could call it this like sports needs cliche. To keep their eye on the strawberries. <laughs> and yeah. Don't worry about the lions coming this way, the cliff in front of them. And as they are on the branch, you've got, what was it? The ants that were eating, that were eating the, the side of the branch. And it was the like, ants eating just, the branch, the elephants chasing them, I think. And the tigers at the bottom of the pit or something. Like and that. you just focus on the strawberry. And that's kind of what I feel like he would get these guys, you know, into, in, into that process. It was a maddening process. And I know a lot of people sit here and they say, Jane's such a home where it's been so in defense of. I've been in defense of Jason because that's what players have told me. That's the knowledge that I have as it relates to their feelings and their affinity for that particular coach. And again, could Mike McCarthy garner that over time? Absolutely. I, I it was funny. There's a, a clip on from uh, Pat McAfee's show today. I think it's important that we drop that in our yeah. podcast. He was specifically asked about this report. Uh, here's what he had to say. I feel like you and the floor have a much different relationship than you and uh, Big Mike had. And I don't know if you got a chance to watch the games last night. Big Mike is entrenched in battle right now with everybody. There's quotes coming out from the locker room that he's not prepared and they don't trust him and blah, 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 all this stuff. Would it be difficult to go from the floor to Mike McCarthy? Like the Dallas Cowboys are going from Jason Garrett, who seems to be the clapper upbeat all the time, to Mike McCarthy. If you had to talk, not that you want to speak on their situation because you're not in the locker room, but if you had to go from like LaFleur to McCarthy, do you think that would have been a difficult transition or no? Look, I don't know. I mean, every every coach has different personality. I think at the core, there's a lot of similarities between, uh, you know, between coaches. I would think... You never want to, to to hear the inside sources or if somebody from the inside or somebody going on, not not going on the record, these anonymous quotes or whatever. You don't ever want any of those things. Uh, as far as I know, what the facts are today, they're in first place in a division. First place in any division, regardless of your record, assures you a home playoff game. Yeah. We won a division in 2013 at 8, 7, and 1. Had to win our last one to get a home playoff game. So, you know, that division obviously has been, been a little down this year with I think Phillies with one, four and one, and the other two teams are one and five. Um, 
you know, but they still have a lot of games against each other. The long season, obviously losing Dak doesn't, you know, doesn't help because he was off to one of the greatest starts in history as far as like the amount of yards he was passing for and the efficiency, um, you know, that tragic injury. But um, Mike is, he knows how to deal with uh, any type of adversity. You know, we went through uh, you know, ups and downs at the time, mostly ups in Green Bay. But uh but I know Mike knows how to steer those difficult situations. But it doesn't matter who you are, whether it's you know somebody talking about a player or a coach. Like you, you never want those unnamed sources to come out. The you know that anonymous stuff. I think that's that's some chicken shit. Yeah, it is rat. It's, hey, don't be a rat. Okay, just keep these things internally. And in the report. Jane Slater said, initially the players thought they would keep it internally, but now things are starting to seep out. It's like, oh, very nice of them for six weeks to decide not to bury their coach publicly. That's a very interesting world to have. All those anonymous, you can get away with saying whatever, whenever, however nowadays. It's wild. It's a wild time to be alive, Aaron. It's a wild time to be alive. Six weeks. I mean, that's just that's just a culture we've talked about on this show about overreactions. You know, you're six games in, um, and, and you're just one game without your you know starting quarterback. So you know, it takes time to to find your identity in any season. You're not going to necessarily find it in six games, whether you're six and zero or you know one and five or two and four, like they are. So, and you got to, on some level, you got to trust the process and give it time to work itself out. Now, last year we had to trust the process. You know, our first six we were five and one, but it was different. You know, things are different, schedules are different, uh, messaging is different, and you just have to embrace the changes and be comfortable in things that make you feel uncomfortable based on your past and a lot of look the other part is half the locker room maybe more in the locker room it's the first time doing it so you know they don't know anything different this is just the nfl to them you know, they haven't been around other coaches or styles they have in college but i think you just have to embrace uh the culture and and that's where the leadership on the, on every team, you know, has the opportunity to 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 lead from the front. And I, you know, I would guess that this week there'll be comments from the leaders that, you know, that clearly talk about the feel of the team. Just like for us, you know, coming back from a, a, a difficult loss, you know, it's it's important for us to messaging to uh, like Mike used to always say, listen to your language. You know, how are you talking about yourself, your team, your situation, your culture? Because that, that's going to talk about the character of the football team. And I look forward to hearing, you know, from our guys and and staying positive and, and realistic about where we're at and where we're going. So I think it's clear that this relationship had it had its ups and downs. And again, I would go back to I appreciate Aaron's sentiments there about the fact that these guys are anonymous sources, but they're also guys that Mike didn't draft. There are also guys that Mike didn't necessarily all sign off on, and Mike could sign off on guys next year. We've seen sort of the power he's wielded in the building. I don't know if I'd name check myself right now either. I, I'm curious, and you know, we I, there was kind of a, a reference a little bit, or, or we we're talking a little bit about how this is you know new for a lot of guys. Then you mentioned that press conference where there were some people in attendance, and one of them was Randall Cobb, and Randall Cobb obviously went off and signed with Houston. But as we mentioned. Um, earlier before this segment with RJ Randall Cobb was a big leader in the locker room and he was a big stabilizing presence for them I guess I just want to kick this over and this would be speculation there's no way to know this obviously but I wonder how different things are and don't come at me with CD Lamb you needed CD Lamb I'm not talking about not drafting CD Lamb I'm talking about just another I'm just just talking about another hypothetical world what is it that how much better would it be for Mike McCarthy right now as he's trying to win the locker room if he had an advocate like Randall Cobb who was as influential as he was in the locker room? I think you can argue that haha Clinton Dix could have been that guy, um, you know, in, in that particular respect. And and I think that that's an important thing. And, and you're right. I, I think there is no, if you want to call it a Venn diagram, there's no middle, right? Like there is no Venn diagram for the Mike McCarthy way and, and whatever. And so everybody is used to things being done a certain way and like all the things like you know the the boxing gloves and the hammer you know to the players of the week and things like that like i i think those things are are cheeky or whatever but they're easier to buy into if they've been 
the way that things are done the entire time. But right. if Mike McCarthy comes in and he's, you know, just dropping these new things and you're this like fourth, fifth year player, you're making you whatever you're making on your second contract with the team. It's, it's kind of like, whatever, this just, this feels like another stop on the road. And right. obviously there's a lot of challenges that this unique season has presented. And I don't think that that's done McCarthy any favors, but I, I do think, you know, I, I also thought a lot about recently uh, how Mike McCarthy took accountability for the turnover differential. And I thought a lot about um, how Jason Garrett handled the Tavon Austin thing after the Minnesota game last year. And so I think that there's improvement in that respect and that's hard to see right now. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, it feels like there are too many fires that, that can feasibly be put out at one time. And again, uh, speculation here, but should it have been a bad sign to us that bringing in McCarthy wasn't enough to keep Randall Cobb here? The, the fact, should we have read anything into that at all that he went, I'm going to Houston now? I'm, I'm being he, serious. No, it's he, all got paid, paid, though. he got yeah. paid. I, I, under, I understand he got paid. I just, I do think it's interesting that it's, I, I've thought about that. I've wondered how much it may have helped, especially right now when there's some discontent to have a, I'm just saying. Wanna, they had a second child. No. All right, they fine. I'm just, I was just, throwing, but I do think <laughs> there would have been some value this year for Mike McCarthy to be able to have Randall Cobb here as an advocate who was already respected in the locker room and who had experience with Mike McCarthy. And I've thought about, I wonder how much that's been a detriment to Mike McCarthy. Like, man, it really would have been nice to have him here right now. But then what would you have done with Cooper Gallup? I mean, does that put Cedric Wilson out? I mean, you're not going to, well, you would have just ended up picking Caleb on chase on probably if you would have resigned Cobb. And if we had to go back and redo that, I would say CD lamb is like, Sure, like sure. Leader, I, you've actually got on. Yeah, this yeah. Right now is what it feels I'm, like. I'm, I'm not saying it's anything that they should have done. Like should have gotten Cobb instead of Lamb. I just think it's interesting. I wonder if McCarthy internally thinks it'd be nice to win this locker room over right now if I had him as an advocate here. Now, see, that is a good point. I think you could get a guy that's seen McCarthy's process and gotten to buy into it. I feel like he's going to have to do something with this defense, though, with Mike Nolan, with. Uh, Tom Sula, it feels like blind loyalty right now. And I think that's an area that has to get addressed. And like I said, I'd reported this a couple weeks ago. People that have worked with and played with Mike Nolan in the past, great guy, just not sure if he should be defensive coordinator. Mm, sounds and like remember, the old Cowboys head coach. And we, <laughs> and we remember, we, we've gone through his record as a defensive coordinator yeah. Well, uh, the whole place will burn down if the the Redskins or sorry, the Washington football team is able to uh, continue that 34 point streak of the Cowboys next week. So I guess we'll sit by and wait for that. Uh, RJ Ochoa is managing editor for blogging the You can follow him on Twitter at RJ Ochoa and uh, listen to all the podcasts over there. RJ, thanks. Appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot and for the are, time, guys. We are as big a fan of yours, RJ, as Good Morning Football and NFL Network. Jane so. is. I'm not. I'm, I'm a huge fan, and we'll get you on next time where I won't talk so much and take up so much of your time, RJ. How's that? I appreciate it, Jane. I also appreciate the content you gave us uh, on Tuesday. Um, I hope that we have some more fun things to talk about, but you guys are killing the podcast game. I like the new cover art, if I'm being honest. So, oh, um, thank you. Yes, yes. There. thank you. Joining us now is Mike McCartney. He is an agent for Priority Sports, and he also uh, represents Sean Lee, Cowboys linebacker Sean Lee, as well as co-represents uh, Cowboys offensive tackle Lyle Collins. Uh, you can follow him on Twitter at Mike McCartney 7 Mike, how you doing? I'm doing great today. How you guys doing? I'm probably doing better All in right, Chicago. I have to get- <laughs> <laughs> Well, I have to get your thoughts on this report that I put out today. Uh, how do you feel about the locker room losing uh, faith in the job that you're doing down there? So I went into character when somebody first brought that to me and said, listen, I've always taught high and tight, high and tight. <laughs> <laughs> Running backs have to carry the ball high and tight after the two fumbles. Anyway. Uh, um, hey, T- yeah, Tiki Barber had to learn that. He had to learn finger on the ball and yeah, all that. Right, right. Somebody else might need to learn that today. But, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, um, you know, those are always uh, explosive reports, right? And uh, when you have adversity is when things like that come out. And, you know, Dallas is having some adversity right now. And uh, it's probably not the only place in the, in the NFL that's dealing with these kind of things. So those are tough uh, issues for uh, coaches and players to deal with. 
Now, I was hoping you were going to have a little fun with me there, Mike, because the reason why we brought you on this show mostly is because <laughs> you are the greatest bit that's going on on Twitter these days during the games. There are so few highlights amongst Cowboys Twitter as it relates to the Cowboys and how the season is going. And you are hearing all of the collective angst because so many fans keep reaching out to you as if you are head coach Mike McCarthy. There's an important distinction. Your name is Mike McCartney. So have you enjoyed uh, understanding what it's like to be a head coach of a football team, particularly the one that has the star on the helmet? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's funny. My fantasy team, uh, I call it's called I'm Mike McCarthy for three hours a week. And I, I need to change that because I'm getting destroyed today, too. Um, <laughs> it, it started in Green Bay when Mike was there. And uh, but it's certainly picked up steam in Dallas. And, you know, you have a decision to make. Am I going to get mad at fans? Am I going to, you know, uh, respond in kind? I just figure let's just have a little fun and a little levity. You know, Twitter is a tough place to be on game day. I get. I, you know, uh, my favorite, one of the bits on the evening talk shows is the read the mean tweets. Do you have a few that you could just read for us that happened during the game <laughs> yesterday? I mean, I, I don't have my Twitter, I guess, in front of me. I have so many responses. Um, literally uh, minutes before you called, though, if I could find this. Um, uh I, I'm still getting killed, like I said. Um, <laughs> I'm gonna see if I can't. How find how whatever. personal? How personal is it? Is it just like, man, you suck, or is it like, you know? Because I I know Travis Frederick recently. He's been retired uh, for a little bit now, but um, I, I guess when Tristan Hill had that controversy of rolling up on, uh, I think it was Chris Carson in Seattle, then there was a lot of people saying that was a dirty play. And I guess Seahawks fans, not knowing who it was, just were googling who Dallas Cowboys number 72 and they were getting Travis Frederick back. And so I know Travis Frederick said in an interview recently that he was getting like, I hope your children die. And like people just like hurl the stuff. Like that was not me. I've been retired for a year now. Wrong side of the ball. Is, does it get really nasty or is it just general? Like, man, you suck. We, you should be fired. Oh, oh no, it gets nasty. Uh, somebody said to fire my fat, you know what last <laughs> night. So, which I love that you zinged back. Come on, man, at least spell it right. P H A T. <laughs> um, shouldn't you be coaching and not tweeting? Just asking writes back. I'm very adept doing two things at once, Jim. And then my favorite from today is, hey, coach, seems like you're losing control down there. Players calling you out. You respond, you got bad info, Charles. I'm actually up in my office and none of my players have called me out today. Get your facts straight, man. <laughs> have a great day. <laughs> so if you too don't have Mike McCarthy's handle and just want to get your angst out, Mike is seemingly taking it for you at Mike McCartney 7. Right, right. Spell it right. Uh, I had a good friend that you know well, Jane, from NFL Network, just text me. He says, I think you need to change your, your picture to a picture of you and Mike. He said that would really throw people Yes, off. yeah. Now, have you have you gotten a chance to uh, talk with him and share with him? Like, man, you got to like you gotta pick it up because I my mental health can't take this on Twitter much longer. I have not since he got to Dallas, but uh, <laughs> a few years ago, A.J. Hawk's wife threw him a surprise retirement party in Columbus, Ohio, and Mike showed up as the coach of the Packers. So I went up to him, and I have known Mike for years, and I said, hey, I don't know if you know this, but uh, a lot of people think I'm you on Twitter. And he kind of looked at me like, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I didn't really pursue it at the time. And again, in Green Bay, it was kind of bad. It's nothing like Dallas. <laughs> yeah, Mike doesn't strike me as a guy that uh, sits in his bedroom at night uh, before he goes to bed and peruses what is being said about him on Twitter. He just doesn't strike me as one of those coaches that would even care to go there or, for that matter, even have a ghost handle. We do know that there are, I, you know, Kevin Durant, of course, had his ghost account, uh, but Mike McCarthy doesn't seem like he cares I, enough. I will him. say, I, and I like generally nobody's ever wanted to like, say who or where but i you know you i have heard from several folks that they'll say oh yeah like most like assistant coaches or scouts or other people around the nfl they do have like accounts that they browse from that are not there so i know that's a, a common thing but yeah i don't know that mike mccarthy is necessarily a part of that i, I don't know that he's got a ghost account that he would search from but you know with all that the talk of you know jane's report and and things like that and things seemingly 
uh, looking rough for Dallas in terms of culture and things like that. Uh, how much do you think your client, a guy you know well, Sean Lee, how much do you think that that team right now is just missing, not necessarily just even his play on the field, but his football IQ and, and his leadership ability to kind of cultivate, uh, you know, a, a, a stronger uh, bond amongst those players right now? Yeah, I'm sure they're missing Sean a lot. You know, Sean uh, brings unbelievable experience, his ability to watch tape and, and, and see things before they happen on a football field, you know, goes a long way, but just the leadership and, and pushing guys. I think a lot of times with a new staff getting on the same page can be difficult at times. And I think we're seeing that a little bit with the defense and having a veteran like Sean, a glue guy right in the middle there would be really beneficial. I would think. Let me ask you this because unfortunately the knock on Sean for years has been, he can't stay healthy and you know him incredibly well. One of the more, uh, visual things I think that stood out for me was all or nothing. You see him on New Year's Eve Mm -hmm. going through the tape after yet another disappointing season. One of my favorite stories was a few years ago, he and his wife will stay in Santa Barbara during the off season, but he flies all the way home, which is, it's just 45 minutes from Oxnard training camp, flies all the way home to board the Cowboys plane and fly back with his teammates. A lot of players will just meet you in California. What other examples of Sean are there that maybe the fans don't see? And unfortunately that narrative of him not being able to stay healthy is what permeates as it relates to Sean. I think Sean takes great interest in his teammates. Uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll talk about uh, a player that's either struggling or doing some great things. And I'll, I'll often wonder, well, you know, when I do this with a lot of my players, do they even know if it's, especially if it's a guy on the other side of the ball, Sean uh, always has a strong opinion. He's he seemingly has always talked to a player. I made a comment about the receiver room and it just seems like it's a really good room. And, you know, he said to me, Mike, we got a great receiver room. And he goes into depth about how each player and what the strengths are personality wise, football wise. And he's very, very in tune. And I think, you know, he genuinely cares about his teammates. That's why he would show up and travel with them. Right. And so we're never going to know all the little things he's doing off the field because he's not going to, I mean, Sean's done so many things for other people off the field. And I find out a year or two later and I'm like, dude, can't we like share that? And he's just, he's not that kind of guy. He's a one-on-one guy that uh, genuinely cares about guys in that locker room, wherever they are, whether they're starters, backups, whether they're offense, defense, it doesn't matter. And I think that's special. It's so funny you say that because I remember when Leighton Vanderish came here as a rookie and of course Sean got hurt that year and there was the transition. I wanted to do this sit down piece with him where the student becomes the teacher. And I think Sean felt uncomfortable about it because the spotlight was going to be on him. And right. he was so focused on making sure that that Leighton uh, was developing and that he wasn't hindering that. And then of course we saw last year him step into that role and, and, and how much they needed him. Uh, they're on defense and being a captain and being a leader. And then you, you see this year and it's, it's hard watching him at practice, Mike, honestly, seeing him yeah. back there on the resistance courts, because you know that this team could certainly use him because to your point, I actually heard this amazing story about Sean Lee as it related to one of his teammates a few years back. I'm not at liberty to share that, but I said to this particular player, I said, I cannot wait to come on a podcast with me one day and share that story. <laughs> because it's so interesting and it just speaks to how much he cares about his teammates that I think there's going to be a lot of those stories when he announces his retirement at some point someday that that are going to come out about Sean Lee that a lot of us have never heard about because he doesn't want people to know about them. He's a very private person. Yeah, he's private and and, and just like you said, he'd rather have the spotlight be on his team his teammate you know so I went to his wedding a few years ago and and you know through the years I've been to a lot of player weddings and sometimes maybe they don't invite a lot of teammates sometimes maybe they do and guys don't show Sean had a lot of teammates there he had a lot of teammates from Penn State and he had a lot of teammates from the Cowboys and you know the biggest names in the team were were there that says something when they when a guy is willing to you know take an afternoon off and go see a, a teammate of his get married they don't always do that so yeah there's He's a special guy. I, I love Sean. I love talking to him. I hate the fact that he's missed so many games from injury. I know it, it bothers him because he wants to be out there helping his team win. And I still think, though, when he's healthy, he's got something to him. You know, he ended strong last year, and 
we just got to get them through this, um, you know, this period now and the next couple of weeks. And, and, you know, as I keep saying, if you're going to miss any time, let's miss the first part of the season. And hopefully there is a stretch run. And in the NFC, I think they still call it the East um, as opposed to the least. Um, there's a chance here. So uh, he's got a chance, you know, he's got a, his opportunity to make his mark on his team. There was a lot of uh, speculation, I think, from people, N- not that necessarily any of it was founded. It was just, I think a lot of people were running, you know, I wonder if it's getting close to time for Sean Lee to hang things up. And he did come back. He's obviously dealt with this injury. Um, how much, to your knowledge and, and to what you can share, how much of a, a question do you think that was for him this off season? Was, do I come back and play some more? Or, or was he teetering at all? Or do you think he was always just, no, I'm ready. I'm coming back for 2020. That's not even in my head yet. I think he handled it perfectly. We talked when the season ended and, you know, it's really easy to make emotional decisions when you're physically beat up, when you're mentally beat up and there's not an NFL player come early January, that's not physically and mentally beat up. I don't care if you win or lose. It's a grind of a season. So when we talked, he said, I'm going to, I'm going to travel with my wife and I'm not going to think about football and I'll make my decision when I got back. And that's absolutely the right way to do it. And I think when he was on his trip, you know, at one point he was like, there's no way I'm not playing football again. I love this game too much. And, you know, I, it's going to be interesting to see what happens this next off season. I, you know, it's, if he's healthy, it hasn't happened a lot, but when he's healthy, he still plays at a high level and he's so smart. I think the Cowboys with all their struggles on defense can, I'm hoping they really find a role for him where, you know, his intelligence, his ability to read defense or offenses and anticipate what's going on before it happens. You know, there's a spot for him to, to showcase all that. And his loyalty, I think, is one thing that's, that stood out. There was an NFC team that intimated to me a few years back uh, when Leighton was obviously shining here in Dallas that if he ever decided that he was done with Dallas or Dallas side of part ways, they were going to come after him. And I remember as that information sort of got out, the Cowboys immediately were able to work something out with him. And as it was described to us, and and what I respect the most about you, Mike, is like you are very protective of your client. So I'm not going to ask you to tell it, tell us what that contract was, but it is my understanding that he gave them a hometown discount, obviously to stay in Dallas. And it sort of speaks for his love for this team. Yeah, it's, <clears throat> you know, as an agent, what's most fun is when you can go to free agency and you can have several teams, you know, after your player in and, and see what their real value is, not the value you decide upon before the market can, before you can get to the market. So, um, you know, in Sean's case, I just knew it would be, it was just going to be really difficult for him to leave Dallas. He's, you know, he's got a special relationship in that locker room. I think he's got a special affinity for the Jones family. You know, he's he's Dallas Cowboys through and through. And I think, you know, even though you you go to free agency and there are some teams that are attractive, at the same point, you, you can't help but think, okay, when I'm 40, 50, 60 years old, to be able to say I played my whole career at the Dallas Cowboys, there ain't, there's not a whole lot of guys that uh, – Played at his level that can say that. I think that's going to be really meaningful for him for years to come. Do you think that uh, whenever it is he does decide to make that call to hang it up, um, you talk about his love for the game and, and his high IQ and things like that. Do you think it's a, a natural transition for him to just say, hey, maybe I want to go explore coaching? Or do you think when he decides to retire, he's you know going to take some time away or, or maybe just not even get back into football post-retirement? What, what do you think he, his approach will be when he's finally done playing? Yeah, we've talked about that. I, he um, he has to coach, right? I mean, he's just too smart. He's got. He's already kind of coaching. Yeah, and so, you know, what level is it? Is it high school or the other, you know, two professional levels, college and pro football? I don't know. I personally think, you know, a Sean Lee at the high school level, not only making a difference in the players on the field, but off the field, he's got so much to offer. You know, for our youth, our seven, 16, 17, 18 year old kids to be able to spend a couple of years with Sean, not only are, is he going to prepare him potentially to play in college, he's going to prepare him for life. I have a brother that coaches high school football. You know, it's a it's a huge job. I think a really important job. And I can see Sean completely flourishing. One of my clients, Josh McCown, has been doing that a little bit off and on the last couple of years. And, and he loves making a difference in those kids' lives. And I think Sean will be exactly the same. We see guys like John Kitna, Bobby, who 
really appreciate high school coaching for that same reason, saying that they really want to buy in uh, to these younger guys and make a difference for them. So without getting in again to specifics, because I know that that is something you're very guarded with. Can we expect to see Sean Lee at some point this season? How at least has his recovery been going? Yeah, I think Sean's progressing well. And, um, you know, he's he's got a uh, – once they, they start his uh, practice window, he gets three weeks to get ready um, in practice and uh, hoping that's sooner than later. Um, but there have been no setbacks. Um, I think he's – you know, the pain is, is subsided, so – He's, he's in a good place and, uh, it, you know, hopefully it's just a, 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 you know, a matter of time here, but, um, you know, I, my hope is when we get to November, you know, we're going to see the full Sean Lee at hundred percent and making plays and anticipating things and beating offensive linemen to the play. You know, that's what he's been doing for years. You know, Jane, uh, the way you can really tell that he's Mike McCartney and not Mike McCarthy is because, um, he actually gave an answer about how a player is progressing back from an injury. So, you know, that's that's how that right there, if you had any question, that's how you know he's not Mike McCarthy. <laughs> yeah, so don't rip me on Twitter as a result. <laughs> well, Mike, I didn't want to take too much of your time today. I just, as I was glancing on the Twitter timeline again last night, I found you to be yet one of the small bright spots as it related to this team and the feedback that it's come with it lately. I didn't want to take up too much of your time today. Thank you for popping on our show. And again, fans, you can have fun with him at Mike McCartney, not McCarthy seven. Well, thanks guys. It's been great uh, visiting with you. Have a great day. Enjoy Dallas on a Tuesday after Monday night football. All right. Well, thank you so much to RJ Ochoa and uh, Mike McCartney for joining us today. Uh, Lots out there to discuss right now with Jane's report and uh, a lot more for us to discuss later this week. Uh, We'll be talking to JP Finley about this game coming up with the Redskins. Man, I got to stop that. I keep saying Redskins, the Washington football team with uh, WFT. We'll talk to JP Finley later this week uh, from NBC Sports Washington. He's always got a good beat on things and uh, we'll look to sort this out a little bit more and hopefully have some more answers for you by Friday. Uh, until then, we'll talk to you next time. Hey, thanks for tuning in. If you would do us a favor, hit subscribe over here. And if you want more Cowboys content, you can check it out over here. Thanks again for watching.